I squandered them all away. Then, success leads to a deadly crime. How could you do this? How? A real Bronx tale. And a young woman and the two men who loved her. I was naive, very naive. I can look back and admit it. A love triangle that would turn into a deadly knot. I didn't want to believe it. My eyes were lying to me. Was it suicide? He always said that he was going to die young. Or murder. And I thought, 19-year-old kids don't pass away. Clues left behind and a chilling question. I mean, he said, if David just disappeared, would you come back to me? Lives cut short. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Adolescence can be a time of great promise, but for some, it's a turbulent period of rough passions and poor choices. And decisions made under the fog of youth can have deadly results. First, Lilo Brancato. His was a classic Hollywood tale, an unknown plucked from obscurity who skyrocketed to instant fame. But as Chris Connolly first reported in 2009, for Lilo, that fame came with a price. Back in 1993, as his young face lit up the screen in a book sale, 16-year-old Lilo Brancato looked to all the world like a teenager on the brink of showbiz greatness, an overnight sensation with electrifying ability. Don't fight on me! I swear, I just went right to school and that was it! The sky was on it. Really? Robert Downey, Leonardo DiCaprio, absolutely. I say that unequivocally. And I wouldn't say that about someone who didn't have the talent. He was plucked from obscurity to work with actor-director Robert De Niro and a Bronx Tales writer and star, Chaz Plinteri. As we were shooting, I remember I said, I hope we're not cursing this kid. Back then, Lilo Brancato was given a once-in-a-generation opportunity in the movie business, handed the keys to the Hollywood kingdom. But 16 years later, in this place, no one is handing Lilo Brancato the keys to anything. An opportunity of any kind is nowhere to be found. All because of one night on this snowy driveway in the Bronx, where in a burst of gunfire, more than one man's dream would be shattered forever. It all started with a day at the beach. July 5th at Jones Beach. 1992. You still remember the year, you still remember the date. Absolutely. Lilo loved to do impressions for his brother Vinny, so when a Bronx Tale casting assistant came by, handing out audition flyers, Vinny spoke up. So I was like, Lee, do Joe Pesci for me. Lee, do, you know, De Niro for him. Talking to me? And he did it, and the guy was like, wow. He goes, you got to come down to the Bronx tonight. What's going through your head when he says this to you? You know, I, all confidence, I, I kind of thought I'd had a shot. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Lilo took a Bronx Tale production team a storm, and he got the part. It was unbelievable. He had natural ability. It was just amazing. I said, what happened to you is is more rare than winning the lotto. Do you understand that? You have to take this and run with it. Do the right thing, work hard, go to acting school, get even better, do everything right. Listen to me, this is a great opportunity. You could be as big as you want to be. I used to say this to him all the time. Some guys never get that shot, you know that. I know that. I just got everything so easy, it just <clears throat> came so easily for me. So easily, he seemed to take it for granted, smoking before acting this scene. Is it better loved or feared? It's a good question. What was going on with you personally during that scene? That was the first time that I ever got hot and it was captured on film. And what's going on in your head at that moment? Um, what do I look like right now? Can, does, does anybody know? Does anybody know I'm high? And if you watch that scene, my eyes are glassy. I'm a dead giveaway. You know, I look like I'm half asleep. Do you think they knew? Do you think Chaz knew? I don't know if he knew exactly that, that I was high, but he knew something was off. Did you know that at the time? To be quite honest with you, I, I, I had a, a suspicion that he was. He could be such a good kid. And then the next minute, he'd be so irresponsible. It was so strange. Before the film opened, Robert De Niro came to Lilo's home to caution him. You mentioned, uh, you know, people, you know, the drugs. 
He did mention drugs. Yeah. Well, he said a lot of people are going to want to be your friends, you know, and they don't have your best interests at heart. So you got to be careful, and you got to choose your friends wisely. You probably couldn't hear a word he told you. I kind of shrugged it off. It was kind of like, uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but not me. I'll be fine, Bob. Recommend alert one. Fame and success did follow. Lilo got roles in Crimson Tide and Penny Marshall's Renaissance Man. Hey, Larry. Who's in that, Larry, huh? Your mother's in that. Got VIP treatment at every club in town. Let's face it, it feels, feels great. I mean, you know, it does feel great. But after a while, I guess it gets to your head. It definitely gets to your head. Yeah, not fame itself, but it was people that changed my brother. You no, know, free drugs, free booze, free women. In 1999, for the Soprano second season, Lilo played a good-looking hothead with a violent streak. Get back in your office. As Lilo's own cocaine use began to intensify. Were you high when you did the Sopranos? I may have been, yes. I may have been, yes. Sometimes I would run into him in a nightclub, and at the club he'd be like, you know, running around, and I'd say, hey, take it easy, what are you doing? Settle down, relax. But he uh, was one of those kids that just just couldn't hold it together. I don't know. It's sad, man. It's 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 sad. Even as his partying continued, Lilo never even moved out of his parents' house in Yonkers. Why didn't he leave? I guess he just had a good, you know, dinner, whatever he needed, you know. This kid had so much natural ability, but did nothing with it. Never went to acting school, never took things seriously, never really read scripts, didn't do anything. Instead, Lilo did hard drugs full time. Instead of having two drinks, you'll have four. And then from the four drinks, then you'll sniff, a, you know, you snort a line of cocaine. And then from that line of cocaine to come down, you'll do some heroin. And then it, it doesn't end. The drugs always, always win. His family staged an intervention, got Lilo into rehab, but nothing took. His brother Vinny felt he knew the family secret that had driven his brother to drugs. Lilo had been adopted from an orphanage in Bogota, Colombia. You know, he'd be going to my mom's room at 3 o'clock in the morning and talking about that, you know, and being upset about him being adopted. It always bothered him. I think that was his, uh, his uh, downfall. Late in 2005, everyone saw that Lilo's need for drugs was out of control. He said, you're fooling around with heroin. And he goes, no, 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 no. And I said, listen to me now. If you don't stop this, and I've been telling you this for years, something bad's going to happen to you. By December, I was a lost cause. I was getting worse every day. Look at you. You lost like 50 pounds. You're a mess. Did you think to yourself, this is going to end really badly? I thought he was going to die. But Lilo Brancato didn't die. Somebody else did. When we come back, Lilo hits rock bottom. I was dope sick. Like, I felt every ache and pain, hot flashes, cold sweats. I started, like, shaking. I needed a fix. And the results are deadly. I got a couple of shots fired. Please don't tell me something happened to my brother. Stay with us. At just 16 years old, Lilo Brancato found fame. He also sank into a life of drug abuse that quickly spun out of control. Twelve years later, the bright young star on the rise would achieve a different kind of fame. But this time, not on the red carpet. Here again, Chris Connolly. New York City's most somber public event, the funeral of a police officer, with his brethren in attendance and words from Mayor Bloomberg. The entire city took his tragic loss deeply and personally. In the fall of 2008, Scores of police officers would also be in attendance at the trial of one of the men accused of murdering Daniel and Chautegui, Lilo Brancato, 
one-time movie star of A Bronx Tale. Each day at trial, they would applaud for Yolanda Rosa, sister to Officer Enshautegui. They call him a cop's cop. Mm -hmm. My brother lived and breathed being a police officer. He, that title suits him well because he was good in what he did. He was one of the good ones, you know? He loved it. He loved taking those bad guys off the street. The trial was a tabloid sensation, starring a Hollywood hotshot transformed into a desperate junkie. Hired to defend Lilo, high-profile New York attorney Joe Tacopina saw this as a case of wrong place, wrong time. Lilo was someone who uh, understood that, that it was his addiction that put him in the particular place that he was at that night. But he also told a story that caused me to believe he had no legal or moral involvement in the murder of a New York City police officer. On a binge at the down and dirty Crazy Horse Strip Club in the Bronx with Stephen Armento, the father of an ex-girlfriend, Lilo Brancato spent the early morning hours of December 10, 2005. By 4 a.m., the men were out of drugs and had to have more. The crack cocaine was eating the heroin to a point where I was, I was dope sick. Like, I felt every ache and pain, hot flashes, cold sweats, started, like, shaking. I needed a fix. To get that fix, they went to the apartment of another Lilo pal, Kenny Scavati, who'd supplied pills to Lilo in the past. Lilo broke Kenny's window, and that awakened the officer who lived next door. He may have been off duty, but he was still a cop. So he headed outside to check, calling 911 as he did so. I'm an off duty MOS. I think somebody broke into my neighbor's home. There's glass and the windows on the floor. It would be the last phone call of his life. Seconds later, as the 28-year-old officer came upon Lilo Brancato and Steven Armento, shots rang out. I remember walking, and I remember hearing someone say, don't move, and I was startled. So I turned around quickly, and I was shot. I was shot twice, and then I just, then I just left. Westchester and Arnold got a pickup of shots fired. Wounded in the chest, Lilo staggered down the driveway and into the street near his car, where he was met by police on the scene. Steven Armento was still holding his gun when he collapsed, all while police tried to save the life of Officer and Shout Take. One minute out for EMS, one minute out. When did you find out that this hunt for drugs had killed a man? Someone came to the hospital bed with, with the newspaper, and he said, uh, he said, hey, buddy, you proud of yourself? He said, you and your boy just killed a cop. I said, what? police officer. Not long after Officer Enshautegui was pronounced dead at Jacoby Hospital, cut down by bullets from Stephen Armento's gun, patrolmen were waiting at Yolanda Rose's front door. And I said the first reaction was, please don't tell me something happened to my brother. And he just said, ma'am, come with me, put your shoes on, I need you to come with me. For his involvement in Officer Enchautegui's death, Lilo's pal Steven Armento would be sentenced to life in prison without parole. The charges against Lilo were attempted burglary and felony murder. That's what the state alleged here, that during a burglary attempt, a police officer was killed and that Lilo was just as responsible as Steven Armento, the shooter, for that crime. Did you know that Steven Armento had a gun? No. I did How not. could you not know he had a gun? I just didn't. I was never a gun guy. I was never into that kind of stuff. No one's saying you had it, but how could you not know that he had it? He knew that it's something that I would be against, and I wouldn't allow it in my car. Absolutely not. You would not. have said, oh, I don't mind scoring all these drugs and stuff and going yeah, to places, but, that, but if you've got a gun, you can't get in my car. Yeah, that's, there's a big difference. You know, it's like already, already we have drugs in the car. People think you knew he had a gun. Of course people think that. He may be a junkie, but he's not a dummy. He knew what was going on that night. Whether he pulled the trigger or not, he committed that murder along with his buddy.
Officer Courtney Mapp was just one of the witnesses whose testimony at trial filled the New York papers before the jury decided to write a surprise ending to this very different Bronx tale. Verdict in the murder trial. On the charge of attempted burglary, Lilo Brancato was found guilty. On the charge of felony murder, Lilo was acquitted. I was slapping my face. Slapping my face. If I could speak to Danny, I would have told Danny, do not get out of bed. My brother could have stood sleeping. He didn't have to get up, but my brother heard it. He heard breaking glass five in the morning. He got up. Before his sentencing, Lilo Brancato read a message of remorse. You said in that statement, I'm a good person. Right. How are you going to prove that to us? Police officer died. And I will always, always make sure that he's remembered for being a hero. I just want him to do the right thing. To me, it's more important right now just that he stays clean, you know? And, and if you don't, I'm done with him. He was sentenced to 10 years. You threw it away. Yeah, I did. I did. What does that feel like? You had the greatest opportunity imaginable for a great career, and here you are. I'm ashamed. I mean, I had the opportunities, and I squandered them all away. I squandered it, you know. What's the last line of a Bronx tale? The saddest thing in life is waste of talent. That's your story, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Even now, at Officer Enshoutegi's precinct, his locker has been turned into a shrine to honor his sacrifice. And from the man who created a Bronx tale, there is deep sympathy for Officer Enshoutegi's family. For Lilo Brancato, there is only anger. He said those words in the movie. I wrote those words. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent, and the choices you make will shape your life forever. I mean, what else do you want to hear? What else do you want to know? How could you do this? How? Lilo Brancato was released from prison in 2013 after serving eight years of his 10-year sentence. Coming up, one woman, two men who loved her, and an unexpected death. I was trying so hard to do everything I could to get him to just, to just breathe. Was it suicide or murder? He always said that he was going to die young. I just couldn't believe that he was right. Stay with us. Christina and Sean Cleland had their whole lives ahead of them. So did their 19-year-old neighbor, David Heinrich. But as Cynthia McFadden first reported in 2007, their lives would become tragically intertwined. And one night, one decision would leave a trail of questions. How did a young man wind up dead in his own apartment? It was called an impossible knot. The story behind it would prove as difficult to untangle as the knot itself. The knot secured a noose. The noose was at the end of a rope attached to the living room wall, pulled tight by the body it held. There on the black sofa, a young man. Broken cigarette in the right hand, suicide note in his left. Dear Christina, it read, I don't love you. You need to go back to your husband. It was Christina who would come upon the body. I turn the light on and that's when I see the ropes. And I, for a whole second, I stood there because my eyes were lying to me. And I didn't want to believe it. It was on the night of October 2nd, 2005 in Brunswick, Ohio, that David Heinrich was found in his own home. 
it appeared he had taken his own life. In a strange coincidence, David's father, Guy, was at home, half listening to the police scanner. That night, his hobby would bring him the most horrible of news. I heard David's name and information come over the airwaves. It was late at night, and I thought I better get over there and see what's happening. Guy called David's mother, Gloria, who also raced to the scene. All I did the whole ride was say, God, please, no. I was hyperventilating. I was crying like mad. When I got to the apartment, I went upstairs and police officer opened the door. I explained to him that I heard my son's address on the police scanner. I wanted to make sure he's okay. And he had a sergeant come out and say that, that my son was, that my son had passed away. And I thought about it and I thought, well, my 19 year old kids don't pass away. He was a treasure to me. And um, just a beautiful person. There are so many things that I don't have answers to. Why would a healthy, seemingly happy 19 year old suddenly take his life? Or did he? He had been stopped on a drug charge a few months earlier. Did David have enemies? Or had he been killed because of a romance gone bad? I grabbed the shears out of the kitchen and ran back around and um, I first cut the rope off the wall and then I didn't really so then I cut the rope off the neck and then I um, pulled him off the couch and set him on the floor and opened his airway and I was talking to him I'm like I'm right here don't worry I was trying so hard to do everything I could to get him to just to just breathe it had all become so terribly tangled like the scene of his death, there was far more to David Heinrich's life than met the eye. He'd say, Dad, I don't feel like I'm going to live to be an old, old man. He always said that he was going to die young. I just couldn't believe that he was right. There were times that I felt like it was all a dream, like David never existed. David had called me about 2 o'clock that afternoon and didn't get a hold of me, and he left a message. He said, Mom, I'm going to take a shower. I'll call you back. So I erased it. I, you, I can't even tell you how heartbreaking, because those were the last words. I, you know, I'll never hear his voice again. And it, I erased it. His parents would later discover that the end of David's life was intimately tied to a romance that began thousands of miles away in Hawaii, a place he had never been. When we come back, the other man in Christina's life. I was head over heels in love. And signs of a marriage headed for trouble. When he gets upset when he drives, he'll start going like 100, 110 miles an hour, weaving through traffic, and you were scared for your life. Stay with us. Nineteen-year-old David Heinrich has been found dead in his apartment. It appears to be a suicide. But why would he take his own life? Or did he? Once again, Cynthia McFadden. To unravel the mystery of David Heinrich's life, we have to go back to 2001 at an isolated Hawaiian beach. A young soldier drops to one knee and asks a girl he has known only a few weeks to marry him. His name is Sean Cleland, hers Christina Eichelberger. In marrying Sean, 18-year-old Christina sees a way out of her strict Mormon upbringing. I think it was that longing to be loved that I had been searching for for so long. And here this, this guy came up and swept me off my feet, literally. And I was head over heels in, in love when we were first together. It was a whirlwind romance, it really was. Sean was a handsome high school wrestler. He was 19 when his parents divorced, an event that would unleash a powerful rage in him. But meeting Christina seemed to erase all of that. 
So tell me about her when you first met her. What did you see when you saw her? Oh. It's just this look in her eyes that, that just, just radiated kindness and love and everything that I had been lacking since my, basically since my parents' divorce. After two and a half months, Sean and Christina were secretly married in a small ceremony at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii. Well, this is the definition of whirlwind romance. I was naive, <laughs> very naive. I can look back and admit it. I was such a newlywed, and people tell you, well, when you're newlywed, it's war and love, you know? But the perils of their young marriage would soon pale in comparison to the tragedy that would be left in their wake. As Christina and Sean Cleland were starting their new life, David Heinrich was just setting off on his. He was thousands of miles away in Ohio, unaware that his life would soon collide with theirs, and unaware of how much pain life could bring. As a little boy, what was he like? He was fun. He was a big Ninja Turtle lover. And if that kid had so many Ninja Turtles, you wouldn't believe. Outgoing, shy, what was he, he like? He was quiet. He was quiet. David had led a sheltered life, raised by two unmarried but devoted parents, homeschooled by his mother, his father's faithful sidekick. Would you say being homeschooled, was he a little naive, do you think? Maybe. He was a non-threatening person. I think because he wasn't combative and he always was a good-natured person, he may have been guilty of not thinking people were so bad. I love you. At 18, the shy young man who loved music and video games proudly got his first job as a barista at Starbucks and rented an apartment just a few miles from his father whose new young son, David, adored. You know, I saw him every day. If it wasn't stopping in to see him at work, I'd stop in and see him at the apartment or spend time with him and, you know, we'd spend the evening together. We just spent time doing things that buddies do and... Uh, yeah, you really socialized together. Right, right. Two years after they got married, Christina and Sean Cleland left Hawaii and moved to Ohio, to this apartment complex where they crossed paths with David, moving in right next door to him. While David was enjoying his newfound independence, Christina and Sean began to argue over Sean's desire to stay in the military. Basically, since I was a little kid, my whole family's been in the, in the military, so that's basically what I wanted to be. That's what I wanted to do. For a time, I wanted to be a JAG attorney. I always knew I wanted to join the military. Christina wanted him to quit, and for a while, Sean tried to please her, agreeing to make a fresh start, leaving the military for civilian life. But after losing two jobs in a row, he gave up. He didn't feel that he could make it as a civilian. He missed the uniform. He felt it was a sign from God to go back into the military. We had discussed when we first were together that he would not make it a career, and here he is about to make it a career. Did you say to him, look, I don't want you to do this? I said, if you go, I know that, that this is going to be the end of us because we have been apart more than we've been married. And I don't know who you are. Tensions between Christina and Sean escalated. Were you ever really physically afraid of him? He would slam things down, and there were times that he would, you know, break things against the wall. So when he gets upset when he drives, and he'll start going like 100, 110 miles an hour, weaving through traffic, and you were scared for your life. Sean tells her he has an opportunity to go to Texas for training as a military medic, and he wants to go. So what happened? He went to Texas. So he went to Texas. And she stayed behind. She got a job as a bartender and became friends with the young man next door, David Heinrich. Though at this point, she says, they were just friends. She was far from giving up on her marriage. She even headed to Texas to see Sean. I went and got um, some very, very nice like lingerie. And I came out and I surprised him. He had the television on 
He looks over at me and says, you look good. And looks over at the television and switches the channel. And I am like, are you kidding me? Did I tell you he was maybe seeing someone else? Oh, yes. In fact, he was having an affair with a female cadet in Texas. A hurt and angry Christina returns to Ohio, where David consoles her, and their friendship turns to romance. She moves in with him and makes sure Sean, who by this time has returned to his military unit in Hawaii, knows all about it. Sean is incensed. He's trying to call you and prolong the conversations and tell you he loves you, he wants you back. But what's the thing that happens that gets him on his feet, gets him to leave Hawaii and come to Ohio? The worst thing that I ever did, Sean had called and me and David were out running errands. So I got on the phone and Sean's, you know, I love you, I want you, I miss you. And I was like, you need to stop this. And he goes, well, just hear me out. In three months' time, he's going to be have his way with you, and he's going to be done. And so I turned the phone to the side, and I said, are you going to be tired of me in three months? And he said, no way, babe. And I think that might have been the starting point there. With that, Sean's battle to win Christina back begins in earnest. Faced with the loss of his wife to another man, Sean frantically tries to win Christina back. On September 8th, Sean sends Christina pictures of himself at the beach where he proposed to her. The next day, his phone calls increase. One day, he calls 87 times in 30 minutes. For nearly three weeks, Sean wages a desperate campaign, and then silence. Two days of silence. It would be the quiet before the storm. When we come back, Christina's husband pays her a surprise visit. Your ex is downstairs, and I'm like, excuse me? And asks her a chilling question. He said, if David just disappeared, would you come back to me? And I said, no, absolutely not. Stay with us. Christina Cleland has separated from her husband, Sean, and moved in with a new man in her life, David Heinrich. The couple believes Sean is thousands of miles away in Hawaii, but he's about to reappear in their lives. Once again, Cynthia McFadden. On October 1st, 2005, Christina and David wake up late. They sense something strange. Christina says something threatening. There was something about the air that was, it was very heavy. So let's talk about the day. Let's start at the beginning and, and, and take me through what happened. The day. I've told this story a hundred times and I know it by heart. <laughs> Even if I hadn't retold it before. Just stop. I mean, this is the day that someone you care deeply about died and yet you start off by a little laugh. It's unbelievable. I can step in a very objective role. I'm watching it like on a screen. So it's more of like a fly's eye view or something, you know. That day, a series of events would unfold that no one could have prepared for. At noon, Sean Cleland arrives from Hawaii. He had gone AWOL. The devoted military man had left his military base without permission. He rents a car at Alamo Rental, where the clerk will later say he seemed menacing, angry, determined. Cleland leaves the airport and begins driving south. Meanwhile, Christina leaves home and heads for work at Johnny's Bar on Pearl Road. And then David calls her. What she hears next will send a chill up her spine. 15, maybe 20 minutes later, he calls me. Your ex is downstairs. And I'm like, excuse me? He's buzzing at the door. He was supposed to be in Hawaii. He was supposed to be in Hawaii, where he was living. I didn't know why he was there. Sean Cleland is frantically buzzing apartment number 121, over and over, relentlessly, shattering the quiet day. A terrified David calls the police. He's like, don't worry, I already called the police. 
They're on their way. And I said, okay, don't go downstairs. So the police came and they shoot Sean off. Now, but why do you immediately go to, he's going to be violent? All he's done so far is rung the buzzer. Because it's the worst case scenario that I can imagine. And in my mind, the worst case scenario was that Sean and David would get into a fight. Enraged that David had called the police, Sean spins out of the parking lot and drives to Johnny's bar. He walks in and sits directly in front of Christina. Her heart stops. I go into the bar area and there's Sean sitting at my bar. I didn't want to flip Sean's switch because I was used to calming him down, keeping things cool. I figured if I could keep him in front of me, I knew where he was. He pulls out this big cigar and just starts to smoking it. And, and that struck me so odd. That had me nervous. He said, if David just disappeared, would you come back to me? And I said, no. Absolutely not. Sean stays for four hours, drinking beer after beer, begging, threatening, pleading with Christina to come back to him. He begins to unravel. Christina is frantic. Finally, he abruptly leaves the bar. For an hour, two hours, there is no sign of Sean. Wondering where he'd have gone, Christina is beside herself. While just a few miles away at Starbucks, David helps clean up shop and heads for home. Within an hour, Christina herself closed up and bolted out the door, rushing home to David. I got in the car and I just, I sped all the way home. I ran through every light, every stop sign, I did not stop. I pulled into the parking lot when, and every time I pulled in before, he always had the blinds open, watching TV, waiting for me, I had candles lit or something, you know? Blinds were closed, the entire apartment was dark. Something was not right. And then she saw David. And it looked like he was asleep on the couch. And that's when I see the ropes. I, for a whole second, I stood there because my eyes were lying to me. And I dropped everything that was in my hands and I ran over to him and he was so warm. Could not find the cell phone, did not have a house phone. Got the neighbor to call 911. Came back and, and started on the CPR. That's where everything starts to get kind of just starts to spiral. Police start to piece together what happened. Was it a suicide as the note made it seem? But then why the cigarette butts and the scattered photos? It was Christina who solved the mystery. It was the knot. When she saw the knot on the rope around David's neck, Christina says she immediately recognized the work of her estranged husband, Sean. There's a special knot that he always used to close his laundry bag when he was in the field so people wouldn't steal his clothes. It's called the impossible knot, and I knew when I saw that that was him. It was around 1 a.m. when she told the police her suspicions. She knew time was of the essence. Sean was scheduled to fly back to Hawaii at 6.30 that morning. Police rushed to the airport, and there they found him, appearing perfectly relaxed. He'd been sending text messages to his new girlfriend in Hawaii, talking about marriage. 2.46 a.m., I wonder where you'll get your gown. At 2.52 a.m., an all-American military wedding sounds great. In searching Sean's bag, police found erotic pictures of Christina that matched the same batch of intimate photos found scattered near David's body. It was those photos, he would later tell police, that pushed him over the edge. The video camera set up next to his bed. I saw the pictures of my wife naked. I saw handcuffs in my wife's dresser, lingerie everywhere. He broke quickly. And then that enraged you to the point where you, you killed him. That's what ended up happening. I didn't, I didn't want to kill him. I just, I couldn't stop. I checked his pulse and I just ran. I, I, Sean talked to the police for 36 minutes. Okay. I was scared. I was freaking out. I had just assaulted this guy, put a noose around his neck. Because he was dead. That's and why he got scared. Correct? 
He wasn't dead yet. He had a pulse. He had a pulse when I left. But then you assume he was going to die? There was a possibility, yeah. It crossed my mind that he could die. Sean tells police that after leaving the bar, he broke into David and Christina's apartment and waited alone in the dark. I mean, this was a man who climbed three stories up, went over a roof, dropped down on a balcony, and went in and waited for the victim. Medina County Prosecutor Dean Holman. He not only prepared the fake suicide note, he rigged the crime scene so it looked like a suicide, then put a cigarette in his hand and left the suicide note there. People sometimes say the gun went off before. I didn't mean it to. You can't strangle someone by accident. No, this was a, this was a cold, calculated, planned act. When David arrived home from work, Sean jumped him and knocked him to the ground, strangled him, and then fled the scene, staging the suicide. Sean Cleland pled guilty. There would be no trial. But on the eve of sentencing, he said he wanted to change his plea, that his confession was a lie. We went to see him in prison to find out what he now says really happened. He tells me a strange story about a man hiding in the back of his car that night at the bar. The man he says was the real killer. I, I just got in the car. The guy popped up as soon as I started to back out of the parking spot. What happened then? He basically made me drive to the apartments, uh, had me by the arm, had his hand in the pocket with the gun that he had, takes me into the apartment, has me sit down, ties up my hands and feet and has me just wait. Until, then what happened? Uh, when David Heinrich came home, a uh, man jumped up, grabbed him, slammed the door, and attacked him and eventually killed him. As you watched? Yes. He claims the real killer threatened him, that if he told what happened, he would kill his niece. The fact that you confessed twice to the police, to your father and to your attorney at the time, we should disregard those confessions. Because you were lying then and you're telling the truth now. Yes. I wonder if you'd believe this story if someone told it to you. Probably not. Seriously, probably not. And to the people who say, this sounds like a made-up story given by a man who doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in prison, you say. I really don't know what to say to them. I'm telling the truth. But the judge refused to let Sean withdraw his plea. At his sentencing, Sean Cleland stood alone and faced the grieving family and friends of David Heinrich. He said just 13 words. Your Honor, I am truly sorry for the death of this young man. He was sentenced to 28 years to life in prison. It was little solace. My son was a treasure. My son 